this lecture is divided into three parts. In part one, we are going to discuss basics. We are going to discuss about the, uh, the structure of the immune, uh, immune system. And we will discuss about the, uh, the classification of immune deficiencies, primary immune deficiencies, and uh, how to recognize an immune deficiency uh, in a child. Then uh, in part two, we'll discuss about the approach, the basic history taking, uh, the important areas in examination and as well as the uh, investigations. In part three, we are going to do something called pattern recognition. Uh, I will discuss what it is when we uh, reach part three. So, right. So, So primary immune deficiencies are a heterogeneous group of disorders characterized by poor or absent function in one or more components of the immune system. So, so as the definition suggests, it's not just one disease, so it's actually a broad uh, uh, variety of diseases. And that is why it, it makes it more difficult for a, a general pediatrician uh, who doesn't see these conditions very often uh, to, to diagnose and uh, as well as manage these conditions. So it's got a wide variation and as I said, broad differential diagnosis. These are rare, so only three in 100,000 newborns will have primary immune deficiencies. And uh, in your career, you won't see uh, more than a handful of uh, primary immune deficiencies unless you work in a tertiary care hospital. And most of these conditions need a timely diagnosis. Now, one good example is uh, severe combined immune deficiency. So, you know, if we do not diagnose the condition and uh, start working on uh, a bone marrow transplant uh, within about three to six months time, you will not be able to save the patient. So that is because of that, most of these conditions need a timely diagnosis. So uh, there are two main challenges for a general pediatrician. One is how are you going to recognize a, a, a normality? You know, I mean, there are children coming with recurrent infections and how do we know, is it normal or is it uh, some form of primary immune deficiency? And the second thing is recognizing severe pulmonary immune deficiencies uh, so that they can uh, be uh, referred to uh, appropriate institutions. Uh, let's ta uh, take one example. Um, this is a common scenario uh, for any uh, practicing pediatrician. So, uh, so the parents generally bring this uh, these sort of children. So baby A, uh, it's a, baby A is a two-year-old boy, and parents are very anxious. So he has had four episodes of coughs and colds uh, since his first birthday. Then he had been seen by GP and had uh, had received two courses of antibiotics for otitis media. Uh, and when you when you examine the patient, the growth, development, all the other parameters are normal, and there's nothing abnormal on general examination. But the problem is the parents are worried that his immune system is weak. So how do you uh, reassure the parents? So, so for that, we need to know what is normal. What is the normal frequency of infections in children? So I'm sure mo most of you guys know this. Uh, so in the first two years, they generally get uh, at least once a month, they will get upper respiratory tract infections. The frequency slowly reduces uh, as they grow old. I mean, once they come to uh, preschools, it's about eight per year. Then uh, by the time they enter school, about uh, the frequency is around four times per year. Uh, but there are lots of other factors also affecting. For example, if the child is the only child uh, at home, I mean, he doesn't get any, uh, there, there are no other children who, who are bringing infection to this child, so they might not get much infections in the infancy. But as soon as they go to preschool, as soon as they go to school, they will start getting these infections so that uh, this pattern might change. So as I said, there are the age is not the only uh, factor affecting the frequency of upper respiratory tract infections. You know the type of childcare. If they are at home, they are going to get less infections. Whereas if they are in a childcare setup, uh, they will get probably more infections. If the parents are smoking, if there are indoor pollutants such as, as mosquito coils, I mean, uh, you know, cooking uh, fires, so uh, cooking smoke, uh, then uh, uh, you know they can get uh, more, uh, the the number of infections they get might be higher than normal. So we need to consider these facts also before we jump in and uh, investigating them for primary immune deficiencies. And, and the other thing to consider is what are the type of infections uh, that you can get, you know, uh, which are not really alarming. Uh, so generally common colds uh, with cough without uh, causing pneumonias, diarrhea generally, I mean, 
true, there are some immune deficiencies as well as certain other conditions in the GI tract can co uh, those children can present with acute uh, several episodes of uh, gastroenteritis, but rarely they are a uh, feature of immune deficiency provided the growth is all right. Then otitis media are generally virus uh, caused by viruses, so you don't need to worry unless they are frequently complicated with uh, suppuration or perforation or if they do not resolve uh, within about one week or so. Tonsillitis is never a feature of uh, immune deficiency. Generally, tonsil, uh, tonsils are absent in most of the severe forms of immune deficiency. So uh, just because you get tonsillitis even like several times per year, you don't really have to think of primary immune deficiency. Another similar condition is UTI. UTIs are also very, very rarely associated with immune deficiency because most of the time recurrent UTI, as you know, the reason behind recurrent UTI is an anatomical defect or or some, something like VUR or VUG obstruction. So you don't necessarily have to investigate a child for primary immune deficiency just because the child gets frequent urinary tract infections. So the big question is, when do we suspect primary immune deficiencies? So, so there's a foundation called Jeffrey Model Foundation. Uh, in 1990s, they, this foundation released this 10 warning signs. I'm sure you may have come across these 10 warning signs in textbooks. Uh, they have been used for, uh, be, be, been available for the past two decades or so, but the issue is these 10 warning signs are neither specific or, or uh, they are not even sensitive enough to diagnose primary immune deficiency. So people are uh, now uh, working towards different set of questions uh, uh, to detect these primary immune deficiencies early. So one such uh, questions are these four questions. Uh, so uh, does the child have a family history of primary immune deficiency? For example, if a, if a previous sibling or somebody in the family had died uh, of infection, then you need to suspect. Has this child received IV antibiotics, especially two or three times for invasive uh, diseases? Uh, is there a failure to thrive or uh, is there a history of recurrent deep-seated infection like such as lung abscesses or uh, liver abscesses or something like that and infections crossing uh, tissue planes like you know you have a uh, you have a cellulitis and uh, within a few days it goes to the bone causing uh, osteomyelitis right now we'll have a look at the structure of our immune system so as you know there are two arms innate immunity you are born with the immune innate immunity and then the acquired uh, arm where uh, you develop that immunity as you grow old uh, after uh, coming across different infections and antigens so innate immunity Physical barriers play an important role. So these barriers such as the skin, mucosal membrane, and flushing action of the urine, those sort of things prevent uh, outside organisms getting into the body. And uh, as, as soon as they enter, there are certain cells and, and proteins such as complements. They fight uh, and uh, destroy these organisms. Then the acquired, acquired immunity is much more developed. So T cells, are uh, there are several types of T cells, they release certain cytokines and they are cytotoxic as well. Uh, and they interact with T cells and promote uh, develop, uh, uh, secretion of antibodies. So antibodies ha ha have a variety of actions such as opsonization or activating the complement cascade. So all, both these arms, uh, they, they, they work uh, simultaneously to, to prevent uh, the child from getting infections. So each of these components, for example, T cells, B cells, complements, phagocytes, uh, each component can be deficient and each one can give rise to immune deficiency. So this table nicely summarizes these sort of features. For example, if you have complement deficiencies, you are pr more prone to get bacterial infections such as Neisseria or uh, uh, strep streptococcus. If you have a problem with neutrophils, either the, the neutrophil count or the function, then again, you are more likely to get bacterial infections. If you have a problem with TSAs, you can get viral infections, fungal infections, and they, 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 are, they tend to be more severe. They, then if you have B cell problems, uh, then of course your antibody production is less, so you, you tend to get chest infections, sinopulmonary infections, and so on. Right. So the classification of PID, so, so when you consider these individual factors, you can classify the PID. So the International uh, Union of Immunology Societies has uh, classified immune deficiencies 
into nine uh, categories. So the category number one would be predominantly antibody deficiencies. Uh, examples would be uh, Bruton's uh, agammaglobulinemia or, or X-linked agammaglobulinemia, a hyper IgM syndrome, transient hypogammaglobulinemia of infancy. So and and of, of course the commonest thing would be CVID. So these are predominantly antibody deficiency. Then you have immunodeficiencies affecting both arms, like cellular and hum humoral both, T cells as well as B cells. So the example would be severe combined immune deficiencies. Then you have you get a set of disorders with they have combined immune deficiencies, but they have syndromic features. So we call them syndromic uh, primary immune deficiencies. Uh, examples would be viscout Aldrich syndrome, hyper IgE uh, syndrome. Uh, we call it Job syndrome as well, and other conditions such as ataxia, injectasia, digest syndrome. So these are we call what we call syndromic uh, primary immune deficiencies. Then we have uh, primary immune deficiencies with immune dysregulation with lots of autonomic features. Uh, one example would be episode IPEX. Uh, we will uh, discuss some of these conditions later on. Uh, autoimmune lymphoproliferative syndrome, familial hemophagocytic lymphohistosis. They all come under diseases of immune dysregulation. Then we have uh, congenital defects of phagocytic number, function or both. Uh, so the diseases such as severe congenital neutropenia, cyclical neutropenia, uh, CGD. So all these things have a pro have defective, either defective uh, phagocytic function or a reduction in number of phagocytes. So number six would be defects in intrinsic and innate immunity. Uh, examples would be conditions like uh, Mendelian susceptibility to mycobacterial disease where certain uh, interleukins are defective and then uh, they won't be able to function. Uh, they are rare. And number seven uh, would be autoinflammatory disorders. Uh, mm, they are again rare, so conditions like familial Mediterranean fevers. Then, uh, of course, complement deficiencies. And finally, there are, uh, we call it phenocopies of PID. So basically the, the immune system itself is uh, working, but then there are antibodies uh, or generally antibodies against certain uh, interleukins so that immune, uh, the, immune, uh, the you know, immune system cannot work properly because of the interference of these antibodies. So these are the nine groups uh, of uh, primary immunodeficiencies uh, and we will be definitely touching on some of them later on. Right, so now that we have completed the basics, we are going to uh, go to the main uh, part of the lecture that is approach to a child with suspected PID. So how are we going to approach a child when, uh, so so we, we, so this child, uh, child comes with, with frequent infections and when we apply these questions, especially the four question system, and we find that this is much more than the normal pattern. So then we will have to, in, uh, investigate, evaluate this child. So we take the normal pathway, we take the history, examination, and of course, uh, investigation. So we will look at each component now. So there are a few things uh, uh, which are important in the history, such as the age of onset, number of infections, the site of infections, type of organisms. We will look at uh, each of these things uh, in detail now. So age of onset gives a lot of clues. So, so there are certain uh, conditions uh, which appear early, there are certain conditions which appear later in life. Uh, so when you consider the age of onset, this graph is very important, this figure is very important. So this shows uh, uh, the level of antibodies in a newborn with age. As you can see, uh, the level zero is that is that is when the child is born. Most of the antibodies are actively transferred across the placenta to the baby. So by the time they are born, uh, this is the antibody level compared to the mother's level. So you can see it is so the concentration of antibodies are more than the mother's level. But after the birth, these things kind of come down, especially by the, by three months, six months time, all the maternal antibodies are gone. Then of course. Uh, slowly the baby produces its own antibodies. 
some of these subclasses such as IgA takes a long time uh, to come to normal levels, uh, so, you know, in several years. But some, of course, uh, you know, for example, IgM come to normal in about one year. So, especially, uh, you know, immune deficiencies affecting the, the humoral pathway or the antibody production, they don't appear within the first six months simply because mother's antibodies protect them against recurrent infections. But uh, other conditions such as t uh, immune deficiencies affecting the T cell pathways and complement pathway, they can present very early. So when you look at infants, uh, you know, children who are less than one year, uh, the common immune deficiencies that we find are severe combined immune deficiency, familial hemophagocytic syndromes, congenital neutropenias, viscal Audrey syndrome, X-linked agamaglobinemia, generally around six to eight months, IPEX syndrome, and complement deficiency. These, all these conditions generally present within the first year. But then again, there are occasions, for example, I, I, I have come across at least uh, one or two children with agamaglobinemia who presented after the first year. I mean, of course, there were a few infections, uh, but uh, they, they had serious infections after the first year, probably uh, because they were not exposed to many infections. Then when they are like toddlers, uh, we, we come across antibody deficiencies, uh, especially uh, CVID, common variable immune deficiency can present at this age, as well as uh, chronic granulomatous disease. Then again, I have seen chronic granulomatous disease appearing in the first year itself. Then when they are a little older, they can still uh, present with primary immune deficiencies such as common variable immune deficiency. Generally, they present in the second decade of life and sometimes even later. CGD again, certain variants present fairly late and some antibody deficiencies such as IgA uh, deficiency and uh, maybe IgG subclass deficiencies can present later on. Right, we look at the site of infection. So the, the, the most important thing of uh, when, when, with regard to site of infection is, uh, if you get infections in sterile areas, areas which are not having any microorganisms, you know, for example, kidneys or, or, or blood or meningi uh, meningi CSF, those are more suggestive of uh, prime uh, immune deficiency. Uh, whereas, you know, skin infections, you know, tonsillitis, those are not really because the microorganisms are already there. So, so those things may not suggest primary immune deficiency, but if you get two or more infections in, in the lungs or in the blood, then we need to really evaluate them for primary immune deficiency. Now, uh, upper respiratory tract infection, you don't generally consider them uh, as serious infections, uh, but there are certain conditions, for example, otitis media, especially if it is complicated with uh, uh, middle ear perforations and it, if it doesn't heal within about one or two weeks time, chronically discharging ears, they may suggest uh, uh, immunoglobulin deficiencies. As I mentioned earlier, tonsillitis, we don't uh, really consider it as a feature of immune deficiency, but sinusitis, uh, we don't see it in young children as you know, sinuses are not very well formed in, in very young children, but uh, as they grow old, they, they can get uh, sinusitis, but Sometimes sinusitis can be a feature of uh, immunoglobulin deficiency, such as common variable immune deficiency or uh, IgA deficiency. Now, chest infections, again, uh, one or two infections, we don't really mind, but if the child gets two or more episodes of pneumonias requiring IV antibiotics, we need to exclude immune deficiency. But one thing to note is that most of the time, these recurrent pneumonias occur due to uh, a reason other than immune deficiency, for example, recurrent aspirations, or maybe anatomical uh, issues, or something like uh, uh, cystic fibrosis. Then uh, pneumonias, which are poorly responding to antibiotics and recurrent lung abscesses, we really need to think of immune deficiencies. Then skin infections, as I said, uh, recurrent skin infections, especially due to an invasive organism or virulent organism such as TAF may not be a, immune a feature of immune deficiency uh, because as you know, some, some patients can be colonized with MRC and they, they tend to get recurrent folliculitis, cellulitis, those sort of things. But then again, uh, deep uh, infections, uh, infections not settling with antibodies, uh, recurrent abscesses may be a feature of certain immune deficiencies and we will discuss some of them later on. 
GIT infections, recurrent viral diarrhea are fairly common, especially in, in third world countries uh, in, in overcrowded places because they get exposed to variety of viruses. So recurrent viral diarrhea, we don't necessarily have to worry about uh, immune deficiency, but certain bacterial diarrhea, especially salmonella. Salmonella, as you know, is an intracellular organism and you need T cell activities uh, against salmonella. So if you get recurrent salmonella uh, diarrhea, it might be a feature of immune deficiency, especially uh, something that is affecting the T cells. Then chronic diarrhea, as you know, there are so many other, uh, so many causes for chronic diarrhea, but then again, we need to think of immunodeficiency as well. Uh, GUTs, uh, we discussed this earlier also, recurrent UTIs are not a feature of immune deficiency. Recurrent UTIs are more suggestive of a, a structural cause or an anatomical cause. So we need to investigate in that line rather than investigating for primary immune deficiency. Then, as I said, this, you know, blood and, and CSF are sterile areas. So the first episode, we don't necessarily have to investigate. But if the child has two or more episodes of sepsis or two or more, two or more episodes of meningitis, we really need to consider primary immune deficiency. But then again, you can get recurrent uh, meningitis uh, with CSF leak. So it doesn't necessarily mean that there is an immune deficiency, but worth investigating. Then a type of pathogen also you need to realize now, uh, certain pathogens are, are highly suggestive of immune deficiency, whereas certain pathogens are really not. But if you get recurrent episodes uh, of uh, invasive infections with encapsulated organisms such as uh, strep, strep pneumonia or hemophilus influenza, you need to really exclude complement uh, deficiencies and immunoglobulin deficiencies. Intracellular bacteria if you're getting recurrent infection, you know, recurrent salmonella, recurrent TB, then you need to consider T cell functions. Then if you are prone to get two or more episodes of meningococcal disease, you need to think of complement de deficiencies, especially C5 to C9 deficiencies. Then uh, if you're getting serious viral uh, infections, uh, several episodes of varicella, several episodes of uh, full-blown EBV, uh, recurrent HSV uh, meningitis, you need to think of T cell function disorders. But then there are certain organisms, uh, either they are they are opportunistic, opportunistic organisms or they are really not pathogenic organisms. Even if they get, if, if a child gets one episode of such infection, you really need to think of immune deficiency. One example would be something like pneumocystis uh, gerovasi, or we used to call it pneumocystic uh, carinae. Or if a child gets invasive candida, you have to exclude immune deficiency, even if they have just one episode of such infection. This is a nice diagram uh, which, shows, uh, which shows the three broader classifications. Although we discussed that there are nine categories, most of the common uh, primary immune deficiencies can be classified into these three groups, B cell defects, T cell defects, and phagocytic cell defects. So B cells, uh, they, uh, they, they produce antibodies. Antibodies are important against capsulated bacteria such as strep pneumonia or hemophilus influenza. Uh, they have some activity against staph also, and they have they are part, uh, particularly important against enteroviruses. So uh, children with B cell defects are more prone to get such infections. They whereas if you look at this sum, um, the phagocytic cells uh, are important Again, again, they are important against uh, staph Staphylococcus, uh, uh, as well as certain other organisms. Of course, Aspergillus and Burkhardtia are mostly seen in CGDs. And then, of course, if there are T cell defects, you can have in the viruses, fungi, bacteria, anything. So this is a nice diagram, uh, you know, showing all the types of infection that you can get with each category of defect. Now, uh, when you take the history, you have to look at certain associated symptoms as well. Uh, what are these associated symptoms? Of course, failure to thrive is an important marker. Uh, as I said, uh, if a child gets recurrent upper respiratory tract infections or recurrent mild infections, if they are not failing to thrive, we don't necessarily have to worry about uh, uh, immune deficiency, but most of the uh, primary immune deficiencies such as KID or, uh, or A, Excelling agama globulinemia, they are associated with failure to thrive. Rashes are an important clue. I mean, these rashes can be uh, in the form of eczemas, petechial rashes, uh, uh, you know, crops of molluscum and uh, viral warts. 
then uh, certain conditions such as uh, Dijot syndrome can present with development delay. And on the other hand, there are certain immune deficiencies, for example, X-linked agammaglobulinemia, where they can get recurrent uh, otitis media with suppuration, they can present with speech delay. And some of uh, the uh, immune deficiencies have autoimmune manifestations in the form of autoimmune thrombocytopenia or autoimmune neutropenia or alopecia or various manifestations. So uh, we, some of them, of course, we will uh, discuss later on. Then we need to ask questions about pregnancy and birth. Now, for example, gestation, if you are if you are born preterm, you are more likely to get uh, recurrent respiratory tract infections. It doesn't necessarily mean that you have some immune deficiency, especially in the first year. Then a duration of attachment of umbilical cord is an important thing, although it's not very specific. For example, even normal babies can sometimes have the umbilical cord without separation, even up to six weeks. But uh, whenever uh, the, the, uh, there is a delay in course separation, especially after three weeks, you really need to think of a uh, condition that might affect the neutrophils. It might be a neutropenia or it might be something uh, like a functional problem such as leukocyte adhesion defects. Then immunization, uh, some immune deficiency, especially T cell deficiency, can have serious problems with uh, uh, vaccine induced infections uh, we had we have several children uh, with uh, mendelian susceptibility to microbacterial uh, infections and uh, of course kid children they can get disseminated bcg uh, infection uh, with uh, bcg vaccination then in western countries uh, they give rotavirus at two months and four months and they can have prolonged protracted diarrhea uh, because of the lack of immunity and uh, they might get disseminated the uh, chickenpox with varicella vaccine because these are all live attenuated vaccines. Uh, I can remember there was one patient who's, uh, who, who has um, uh, interleukin, I think 12 deficiency or 17 deficiency, uh, who's coming with recurrent TB infection. That one sibling who died at two months had died of disseminated BCG. But uh, this, this family history was not taken properly and this child was given BCG vaccine at birth and this child also had the same condition and had disseminated BCG uh, infection in, in, in two months time. So, so that's why very important to take a family history. If there are uh, things to suggest a primary immune deficiency, you need to really evaluate the child before giving routine vaccinations. Family history, uh, as I said, very important. So it's probably the most important clue in the history. So if there are family history of uh, children dying of infection, especially males, and if there is a history of consanguinity, as you know, uh, most of these uh, primary immune deficiencies are monogenic disorders, and majority of them are actually autosomal recessive. Uh, maybe the probably the only immune deficiency that is kind of polygenic or multifactorial is a common variable immunodeficiency. So uh, other than that, most of the, at least the most of the common immunodeficiencies are uh, single gene defects. So, so consanguinity is an important thing. And certain conditions uh, which are uh, X-linked, such as X-linked skid or X-linked chronic granulomatous diseases or X-linked uh, viscot Aldrich disease. So you really need to think, uh, ask whether there are any maternal uncles with the same disease. Now we come to the examination, All right? So, so you need to look at the general appearance, growth parameters, and of course, a detailed thorough uh, systemic examination. One important thing is uh, dysmorphic features. We will uh, discuss that in a future slide. Uh, and of course, lymph nodes and tonsils. As you know, some of the most serious uh, immune deficiencies such as X-linked agammaglobulinemia and skid, they will not have lymph nodes or tonsils. Uh, so dysmorphic features are seen in several uh, primary immunodeficiencies. Uh, so this is, uh, can you think of what the disorder is? This is Dijo syndrome or CATCH-22. Uh, so they have hypertelorism, epicanthic force, and their nose is kind of short with, uh, with the tip turned upwards. They have a rather smooth filtrum, thin upper lip. This, oh, this is a Dijo syndrome. Sometimes they can have cleft palate as well and of course, congenital heart disease. Then this, can you think of other diseases? 
So as you can see, uh, if you look carefully, there is uh, atopic dermatitis. You can see an abscess here. This is a, uh, if, if, you, if you had felt the, uh, uh, the lesion, this is a cold abscess. And you can see uh, prognathism. And sometimes they can have a, what, what is described as fleshy nose. So this is hyper IgE syndrome, autosomal dominant variant. We also call it job syndrome. So dysmorphic features are important. Then as we discussed, there can be several uh, skin manifestations. Eczema is fairly common with conditions such as viscot old ridge or episode. And particular rashes are seen in uh, viscot old ridge again because they have associated thrombocytopenia. Ma widespread molluscum or warts are mostly seen in T cell defects. Uh, and candidiasis, there are, you know, there's a condition, as you know, there's it's a group of disorders called mucocutaneous candidiasis, uh, so which is seen in several disorders such as episode or interleukin 17 deficiencies. And so when you look at the mouth, uh, most of the neutrophil disorders, uh, either uh, severe congenital neutropenia or cyclical neutropenia, they can have uh, mouth ulcers which are not healing or uh, when it comes to cyclical neutropenia, which, which appear, uh, you know, in a, cy in a cyclical manner, as well as gingivitis. So those are this, the, those uh, those features suggest uh, neutrophil disorders and oral thrush, of course, can happen with uh, most of the T cell immune disorders, such as severe combined immune deficiency. Then uh, heart examination is important if you are suspecting Dijot syndrome. Then uh, hepatosplenomegaly is again seen in a variety of conditions such as chronic granulomatous disease. And CNS examination, uh, there's a condition called ataxia telangiectasia, one of those syndromic uh, primary immune deficiencies where you the ataxia is there uh, from two, three years onwards. Uh, as soon as the child starts working, the ataxia appears and that ataxia progressively worsens. So, so if you are if you are dealing with a child with recurrent uh, sinopulmonary infections, uh, you need to look at, look for ataxia. In addition to that, they can have uh, telangiectasia, especially in the uh, eye as well as earlobes. Right. When it comes to investigations, this is pretty easy. So you need to know only a few investigations, seven to be exact: uh, full blood count, serum immunoglobulin levels with you know each component, flow cytometry for lymphocyte subsets. NBT complements specific antibody responses. So what we mean by specific antibody responses is uh, antibody response against polysaccharide vaccines. It might be diphtheria antibodies, tetanus antibodies, pneumococcal antibodies. And of course, you need to make sure that we are not dealing with HIV. So we, if, you, if you do these seven investigations, we can, I think probably almost all uh, immune deficiencies can be uh, Diagnose at least we can have a provisional diagnosis if we have if we can do this. So uh, nothing much to think. I mean, you just uh, order all these things, then you probably will, will be able to diagnose one of these immune deficiencies, right? All right. So so now that we have discussed about the key features in the history, examination, and investigations, now we can I think move on to the the rest of the uh, lecture that is pattern recognition. Recognition. I think uh, when we are working in pediatric units, uh, or maybe even adults also, or maybe even if you are answering questions, this is probably the most important skill to develop. That is pattern recognition. Rather than this is time saving, obviously. So rather than you know, I'm not saying taking a detailed history examination and investigating in a methodical way doesn't. I mean, it, it is useful, but then again. Uh, it is much more easier to recognize a specific pattern. Uh, the good thing about the primary immune deficiencies is most of them will have a uh, kind of a recognizable pattern. So, so we need to develop our skill in pattern recognition. So what, what we are going to do is from this point onwards, I'm going to present a few case histories uh, and then we'll try and recognize the pattern. So this is the case number one. Is age three months presented with diarrhea for six weeks and failure to thrive. On examination, he was thin with a skin rash, oral thrush affecting both uh, oral thrush as well as thrush, uh, the candida in diaper area. So his uh, full blood count is given. So he's got a uh, white cell count of 5.3 with 90% neutrophils and lymphocyte 4%. HB and platelet seems to be okay. So what do you think uh, the condition is? So this is kind of the classic pattern that you will come across. 
So the most important clue is the full blood count. So if you so uh, so when it comes to primary immune deficiency, the, the, you need to really calculate the absolute count. So you need to calculate the absolute neutrophil count as well as the absolute lymphocyte count. So if you look at the if you if you had calculated the absolute lymphocyte count, it's somewhere around 200. Uh, generally, if the absolute lymphocyte count is less than 2,000, you need to suspect uh, severe combined immune deficiency. As you know, when the when uh, babies are born. They have predominantly after the initial week. They predominantly have lymphocytes more than granulocytes, and this pattern reverses when they are about four years. So if they, so they have more than definitely more than two thousand uh, lymphocytes. Uh, if you take the absolute count, if it is less than that, you need to suspect uh, primary immune deficiencies. If it is even lower, something something less than if it is less than thousand, we definitely we are dealing with a probable severe combined immune deficiency. So this is severe combined immune deficiency. Right, so uh, just a little bit about severe combined immune deficiency. I mean, it's, it's again a diverse group. There are lots of uh, variations. I mean, uh, you know, you can read the Nelson, and there's a, a nice table with all the, at least the all the known types of severe combined immune deficiencies. But what is important is the excellent form. I mean, fifty percent of the severe combined immune deficiencies are seen in male babies because it's excellent. Uh, they they have absent T cells and B cells both. So the thymus is absent. And they generally present within the first three to six months because you cannot survive uh, infection without T cells. As I said, the hallmark is lymphopenia, and they do not have lymph nodes, tonsils, or adenoids. Thymus is for most of the time absent. And in most of the developed countries, the screening programs are there now to to identify them early. The the reason is if if you can identify skid early within the first three months before the first infection and refer them for either gene therapy or bone marrow transplant, then the prognosis is excellent, almost uh, 95 to 100%. So you can get any type of infection from bacteria, virus, uh, fungi, uh, uh, BCG, so, so, so the whole gamut can happen, uh, happen to a skid baby. And uh, most of them will have hepatitis plenomegaly. Failure to thrive is kind of invariable. And sometimes, Mother's T cells can cross the placenta, and as you know, if since these babies don't have T cells, B cells, mother's T cells will proliferate and attack the baby cells. We, it's a form of a graft versus host disease, so they, they can have diarrhea, a rash. Uh, so this is uh, a severe candida or a thrush. So uh, if if generally, I mean, I mean, it's not a rare thing to have candida in babies, especially if the mother's nipple has. Uh, Candida, then the baby will acquire candida, uh, and the mouth might look like this. But if it doesn't respond to treatment, and uh, when it is recurrent, and you can't find any candida on the mother's nipple, then you really need to suspect uh, any form of immune deficiency that is affecting T cells. So this extra, uh, the image on the uh, right, the image a, uh, left rather, A shows uh, the normal thymic shadow. Then image on the right hand side, you can see uh, the thymus is absent. So this is a, a rare form of uh, uh, skid. You may have come across. I, I have seen at least two babies again. Uh, so they present with again this similar to uh, any skid, but the characteristic in this this erythroderma, the skin is peeling and they don't have hair. Alopecia is there, and uh, invariably failure to thrive is there. They have hepatitis plenomegaly. So this is uh, called Omen syndrome. It's an autosomal recessive condition. So this is this in this condition, there are certain T cells which are active. Then these T cells attack their own body. So it's it's similar to graft versus host disease, but uh, it's the it's the baby's own cells that is attacking, right? Uh, so without again bone marrow, uh, they are not going to survive. So the treatment is bone marrow. There are certain few uh, few uh, genetic conditions caused in skid which uh, settle with the uh, gene therapy very successful. Right now we'll move on to case number two. So again, similar child, maybe a little bit older, aged five months. He has had refer uh, several episodes of infected skin ulcer. So uh, skin lesions, uh, re repeated episodes can happen with neutrophil either function or, or neutrophil uh, neutropenias, as well as uh, uh, humoral immunity problems, as well as complement deficiencies. So he has within this five month period, he has had, 
he, he was treated with IV antibiotic twice. Then there's a delay in umbilical cord falling as well. So it had taken about six weeks for the cord to fall. It's a girl, by the way. So when you look at the count again, just like previous example, you need to calculate the, the absolute counts. If you calculate, you will find that absolute neutrophil count is around 200, 250. So when you have less than 200 absolute neutrophil count, we call it a granulocytosis. If it is less than 500, it's severe neutropenia. But as you can see, the other cells, cell lines are relatively all right. So we call it severe congenital neutropenia. One form uh, this uh, disease is uh, Kosman syndrome, which is the autosomal recessive form of severe congenital neutropenia. Uh, as we saw in this case, they get recurrent cutaneous and subcutaneous infections, uh, and of course, umbilical sepsis, ENT infections, and they are prone to get mouth ulcers, gingivitis. And, and one important uh, feature of this neutrophil disorders, uh, especially congenital, uh, severe congenital neutropenia and LADS, uh, leukocyte adhesion defect, is that you don't see pus, or if at all, there's only a very little pus. You get, you, you get skin ulcers, but without pus. Uh, they are also prone to get uh, myelodysplastic syndromes, uh, but most of the th uh, time they uh, respond to filgastrin or, or uh, GMCSF. Uh, but if it doesn't respond to uh, colony stimulating factors, you will need to go ahead with bone marrow transplant. Uh, there are a few other neutrophil disorders of interest. Uh, neutropenia uh, can be a part of several conditions. Now, uh, there's something called Sochman diamond where you have, uh, in addition to neutropenia, you can have metaphyseal dysplasia and pancreatic insufficiency, Chedia Kigashi, where you get, uh, so that's that's a functional disorder. Then uh, another functional disorder would be chronic granulomatous disease and of course, a decision defects such as lead. Right, we move on to case number three. A three month old baby boy presented with pneumonia for one week. He had poor weight gain and an eczematous rash. He had a history of blood in stools. Both eczema and the blood in stools were attributed to formula feeding. Uh, here, the uh, full blood count is there. Uh, the, the white cells are all right, maybe a little bit of lymphopenia. Uh, but the typical, uh, the, the, the hallmark or the classic feature would be the platelet count of 60,000. So this is Viscotoldis syndrome. Uh, so Viscotoldis syndrome is seen only in boys because it's X-linked recessive. Uh, it has eczema, thrombocytopenia. We call it microthrombocytopenia because these platelets, if you look, do the blood picture, they are small. And of course, they have a combined immune deficiency. Mm, and the treatment is immunoglobulin might help, but most of these babies need uh, bone marrow transplant. So this is one picture. If you look carefully in the foot, there you can see the eczema. This is a slightly older baby. Uh, if you look under the eye, you can see a kind of a hematoma and the petechial rash, suggesting that the platelet is low. So, viscot Audrey syndrome is 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 one uh, one is one disease uh, which classify, we classify as syndromic uh, primary immune deficiencies. So, we discussed before one one is this uh, ataxia telangiectasia. We have already seen a digest syndrome and hyper-IG uh, E syndrome, again another syndrome. Right, eczema, which is seen in viscult Ulrich, is also seen in uh, quite, another, uh, quite a number of, uh, in quite a number of uh, immune deficiencies. So, so hyper-IG syndrome, apex, epicets, uh, some of the conditions. So we'll move on to case number four now. So why was born to healthy non-consanguinous parents? He has a sister who is healthy. At two months, he presented with cutaneous candidiasis. This is actu an actual patient. I mean, uh, those who have uh, worked in ward one for Funit at Larich, and uh, those who have worked uh, with Dr. Nawada may have come across this patient because he's a frequent visitor to the ward. So at two months, he initially presented with cutaneous candidiasis, widespread candidiasis. So at that time, also people suspected immune deficiency and, and did a lot of investigation. They couldn't find anything. Then at two months, he, he was investigated for pyrexia of unknown origin. At the same time, they found that uh, in addition to failure to thrive, he had atopic dermatitis, he had hair loss, and there was also prolonged diarrhea. And his sugars were abnormal, very high. So he was diagnosed with type 1 diabetes. 
So at, at seven months with all these features like multiple polyandrochrominopathies, uh, then atopic dermatitis, alopecia, uh, the, 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 the clinicians initially thought apicid, which can have a similar presentation. Apicid is autoimmune polyandrochrinopathy, candidiasis, ectodermal dysplasia. So it, it fits with that also. But uh, in, in episode, you mostly see Addison's disease and hypoparathyroidism. Uh, you can see diabetes also and hypothyroidism as well, which this patient did not have. Then at 80 months, he had an episode of hemolytic anemia, which required treatment with steroids. So this is the cl a classic example of IPEX syndrome. So IPEX is immune dis dysregulation, P is polyandocrinopathy. Uh, e is enteropathy and X is X-linked. So, so they can have hypothyroidism, diabetes, all sorts of endocrine abnormalities. They can have several forms of skin lesions, but eczema is the most notorious thing and the fact that they are having alopecia, nail dystrophy. Uh, they can they are prone to get hemolytic anemia this child of course has had several episodes and on steroids for a long time they can have Im immune mediated thrombocytopenia and of course this child went on to develop uh, nephrotic syndrome also somewhere around three to four years and the and if i'm not mistaken the the biopsy showed glomerular uh, membrane uh, proliferative glomerulonephritis So IPEX is one of the disorders with autoimmune features. So there are whole heaps of diseases with autoimmune manifestations. So I'll show you this table. So some of the common things that we have already seen is viscot Audrey syndrome, um, common variable immune deficiency has lots of autoimmune features. Uh, C2, C4 deficiency, they are associated with SLE. Uh, CGD can be associated with uh, inflammatory bowel disease. Then some of the rare things like episode uh, IPEX and autoimmune lymphoproliferative disorder, they all can have autoimmune features. All right, again, then now we come to one of my favorite uh, patients. So this patient came about five years ago. Uh, a nine-year-old girl was referred uh, due to recurrent skin abscesses from six months. She had one episode of superiority otitis media and eczema from three months. Parents were non-consanguineous. Her maternal uncle had a similar condition. So as, if, as you can see, there is a large lump uh, in the cervical, upper cervical region. If you had palpated, this was an abscess. But what was surprising is this abscess was not warm to touch. We call it cold abscess. And she had few dysmorphic features also. Uh, one thing that was striking is she had two uh, sets of teeth. So she had actually retained her primary teeth. So what is in front is her primary teeth. Then the uh, secondary dentition is at the back. So she has actually now two rows of teeth. And uh, her nose also had what we call fleshy appearance at the tip. Uh, so this is the x-ray. So you can see the two sets of teeth. And when we took the x-ray, uh, there was some, I don't know whether you can see it, but then there's a large pneumatocele uh, on the uh, right upper lobe, which was quite asymptomatic. So, so what is this condition? This is autosomal dominant hyper IgS E syndrome, also known as Job syndrome. So they have early onset eczema. It's kind of a reaction to candida and staph. Recurrent skin abscess, so their, their main problem with immunity is they cannot mount an immune response against Staphylococcus and Candida. So they get cold abscesses, pneumatoceles because of Staph. And the striking feature is when you look at the antibodies, they have eosinophilia, uh, so IgE levels of more than 2000, this kind of diagnostic. Uh, we generally give them antibiotic prophylaxis, they like Cotrim, sometimes we give IgG. Uh, this Because uh, in the history also, she her uncle, has been uh, having the similar condition, suggesting that uh, it's an autosomal dominant condition. Right, so the next case, a four-year-old, this is um, a four-year-old previously healthy child, child admitted with progressive worsening of cough for several weeks and low-grade fever, chest x-ray showed diffuse infiltrase and CT showed reticular nodular interstitial disease, bronchial video lava showed uh, grave aspergillus. So 
so so I, we, I think we discussed initially also uh, can, uh, you know organisms like aspergillus are not really uh, seen in routine uh, infections so th these are seen in special conditions one one such special condition is chronic granulomatous disease the basic problem with chronic granulomatous disease is uh, they are not able to produce free radicals inside the macrophages and neutrophils so they are not able to uh, destroy certain types of bacteria so they are more prone to get staph infections aspergillus salmonella as well as fungi and mycoplasma so they can get pneumonia lymphadenitis deep seated abscesses most of these patients have lymphadenopathy as well as hepatosplenomegaly they are failing to thrive and uh, sometimes they present with granulomas uh, these granulomas can present especially bladder granulomas can present as uh, blood outflow obstruction and hematuria uh, investigation uh, when you do nbt test you can diagnose it uh, generally we manage them with cotrim to prevent bacterial infections and itraconazole to prevent fungal infections but the definitive treatment would be bone marrow transplant right um he he's another pattern to recognize a uh, b and 11 uh, and 11 month old uh, baby boy has had five episodes of otitis media during the last six months we discussed initially otitis media is not considered as a serious condition uh, because they are mostly viruses but then four out of these four had been complicated they had perforated eardrum and the last one is still not uh, healed properly uh, despite the the ENT surgeon inserting a groma and the discharge is foul smelling so this is a, a classic presentation of antibody deficiency so this child has X-linked agama globulinemia or what we call Bruton's disease so the basic pathology is on the X chromosome, there's a dish, there's problem with the Bruton tyrosine kinase, which is important uh, for pre-B cells to mature into B cells. So uh, they don't have B cells in the in, in the peripheral bloodstream. Uh, so agama globulinemia can uh, be there in several other conditions, uh, such as chronic, uh, sorry, CVID, common variable immune deficiency, as well as uh, transient hypogamma globulinemia of infancy. But in both those conditions, B cells are there. So if you don't have BCS, it is Bruton's disease. They have severe hypogamma globulinemia. Uh, they don't have IgM antibodies against the, their own blood groups, such as so anti-A or anti-B. And uh, they don't have tonsils or lymphocy, uh, lymph nodes, just like uh, severe combined immune deficiency. So we see them in, in boys. Uh, they generally present once the maternal antibodies wear off by about six to nine months. They usually come with recurrent sinopulmonary infections, ear infections. Rarely they can get serious viral infections also, especially enterovirus. Enterovirus can cause a, a severe form of myositis as well as a severe form of uh, almost fatal condition uh, because there is hardly any treatment for uh, enterovirus, uh, a severe form of meningoencephalitis. Right, so this is another classic example of a condition. Uh, S, age four years, is recovering from successfully treated meningococcal meningitis, zero group, there are several zero groups, so as you know, uh, B, Y, A, W, so he has had, so basically SZ has, has had one episode of meningococcal meningitis, and then later on another meningococcal septicemia with a different serotype. So recurrent meningococcal infections are the, the hallmark of uh, terminal complement deficiency, C5 to C9. So this is the complement system. Uh, so it's this is a set of proteins produced by the liver from C1 to C9. Uh, there are several mechanisms of activating the, the classical pathway by antigen antibody complexes and of course alternative pathway by the by, by the pathogens itself. But the uh, the common pathway starts from C3, and then the whole cascade happens. So there are a variety of functions of complements. Uh, some of them are uh, they have the opsonizing uh, features so they coat the bacteria so that uh, they can uh, be easily engulfed by neutrophils or macrophages some of them act as uh, mediators of acute inflammation so they, they recruit neutrophils they recruit macrophages and cause inflammation uh, but this final set so c5 to c9 and this is a membrane attack complex they will attack certain bacteria, uh, puncture holes on the cell uh, cell wall and destroy them uh, so this is this set is important for a protection against Neisseria. So th that is why children with complement deficiencies can present with recurrent Neisseria infection. Some of the other deficiencies such as C1, C2, C3 can present with autoimmune disorders such as SLE. 
Some, of course, can present with glomerulonephritis. There is hereditary angioedema with C1 esterase. So, variety of uh, clinical features. So, uh, now we come to the final uh, pattern. So, read carefully, uh, A, age 13 years. So, so this uh, girl has been healthy till two years ago. Uh, and now she's getting recurrent sinusitis needing antibiotics. Uh, she presents with a prolonged fever and productive cough and the x-ray shows pulmonary infiltrates. She undergoes CT which shows bronchiectasis. Now, full blood count is normal, immunoglobulins are there, and you can, as you can see, her IgG level is low, IgA is low, and IgM is relatively okay. So, this is uh, what you see in common variable immune deficiency. So, there is no uh, variation with sex, both males and females can be affected because most of uh, this is kind of a polygenic inheritance. All the other conditions that we have discussed so far are monogenic. Uh, generally, they, uh, they present in the second decade, but then again, I have come across children who are presenting as early as three to four years. Mm, it's the, the spectrum of infections are similar to X-linked agama globulinemia, sinopalmary infections, uh, diarrhea, so on and so forth. Uh, but the difference between X-linked agama globulinemia is that they have B cells uh, if you do the flow cytometry. They are prone to get uh, malignancies and autoimmune uh, features. So, in fact, one of our patients, uh, the one uh, who was diagnosed at the age of three years, went on to develop lymphoma when he was around 11 to 12 years of age. Uh, and uh, another thing that is con uh, contrasting to extreme agamoglobinemia is the presence of lymph nodes, tonsils, and splenomegaly in uh, most cases. Right, in summary, uh, we've discussed uh, how to differentiate the normal frequency of infections from a, a more serious uh, primary immune deficiency. We have discussed about the classification of primary immune deficiency. There are nine categories. We've uh, discussed at length about the uh, key features in history, examination and investigation. And of course, finally, we have discussed certain, certain classic presentations so that uh, we are familiar with uh, recognition of patterns. Yeah, so that brings me to the end of the presentation.